Welcome back folks and another project that we've got on the desk to show you. This is a 1950s Lab Gear LG300 transmitter and we're going to be doing this project in two videos I think because uh, we've got a little bit of work to do on this. But it's quite an interesting transmitter and let's uh, take a closer look at it. So this beast of a 1950s transmitter was uh, given to me by my mate Ian, G6TVJ, and I've basically been tasked with trying to get it working again. So just to give you a bit of background on what these are all about. So these were probably, I would say, top of the range uh, amateur radio transmitters back in the day. And uh, this thing would cover from 80 meters up to 10. AM and CW didn't really have SSB when this was around, or SSB was just starting to come into popularity. So AM and CW. And interestingly, it was advertised, if you look back at some of the old amateur radio magazines from the 50s and 60s, it was advertised <laughs> probably a bit inappropriately by today's standards, I think people, people would probably get offended, as a real man's transmitter. And I think the reason for that was because it was capable of uh, quite a bit of power. I think with the single 813 and the PA, it was capable of about 100 watts or 150 watts carrier thereabouts, certainly on AM. Uh, so that's actually puts it up, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty pokey, uh, pokey transmitter. And uh, it's quite interesting because when they made these, when they sold them in the 50s, it was, it was sold, well certainly the, the earlier ones were sort of sold as is, and you had to build up your own power supply and modulator for it. And I think back then... The uh, amateurs at the time, you know, were quite capable of doing that. You know, they were quite happy messing around with high voltages and getting something like this to work. So the problem or the challenge that we've got is that I haven't got a modulator and I haven't got a power supply for it. So those are the things that we're going to have to try and build to get it to work. It, we'll have a quick uh, look at the front panel and I'll take it apart I have done a bit of work on this already in terms of just making it a little bit safe because as you can see when we take a closer look at it you know it has got some slightly non-standard um, <clears throat> antenna fixings there which uh, certainly weren't uh, uh, used when this uh, thing was manufactured. Anyhow we'll just have a quick look at the front panel and then I'll, I think we've got to try and unscrew it and see what it's like inside. So if we start at the top part of the transmitter, you've got two big controls there, which are for the uh, PA, the, the uh, PA tank tuning and the loading. And then the switch in the middle there is for obviously switching the bands for the PA. Now, originally this transmitter would have had Belling Lee connectors on it, which are, for those that don't know, are the old TV um, aerial uh, sockets. Uh, so I've actually replaced these with sort of more standard PL259s. So the the one on the right is obviously for the aerial, the main aerial, and then what I, I've put a BNC connector there, socket for uh, so that I can connect up a receiver. I've already added a relay uh, so that you can change over to receive and transmit. And then the rest of the Indicators and switches are pretty standard actually for a sort of basic VFO, exciter, exciter or frequency multiplier, PA type arrangement that you would see on a, a vintage transmitter. So you've got the VFO tuning there. And then you've got your drive control. And I think there's a, that's another thing for peaking the drive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unscrew it and uh, we can have a quick peek inside. So 
So I've got quite a few of these uh, screws to undo. take a little bit of time to do these so bear with us so hopefully this should just pull out Try and find a place to rest it on as a transporter there. We'll just get rid of this. Okay. I think what we'll do is we'll have a look at the uh, Top part first, I think we can rest it on its side. There we go. Well, nice bit of 1950s uh, radio engineering. I've actually done a few mods on this already to uh, make it a bit safer, but I haven't opened this for a while because uh, I've been busy with other projects. So let's take a closer look at it. Okay, so transmitter's on its side. Normally it'd be up on its uh, end in a normal state. So what we're looking at here is the PA compartment. And obviously the main thing here is, eight, what is the 813 power PA tube. And that's the uh, um, <clears throat> plate choke. And I've obviously made a, a few little alterations to this, or modifications. Um, that's the uh, aerial changeover relay that I've put in there. Uh, the rest of it's um, fairly standard type arrangement for the PA, so it's a Pi output uh, filter. So you've got quite a, quite a big chunky tank coil down there. and. Uh, PA tuning capacitor is obviously quite big and chunky. This valve here, that's um, KT66, which is a clamp valve uh, for the PA. And then moving over this side, so that screened box here is your frequency multiplier valves, which I'll show you on the other side. And I think they've got the various bands, 80, 40, 20, 15, 10. The box there is uh, the VFO. And I think that transformer there supplies the heater voltages. Uh, so you've got to supply the uh, the PA voltages. And obviously if you're using a modulator, you'd have to supply the modulator voltages, voltages as well. This here is a high voltage connector that I've put on. Now bear in mind that the PA voltage of that 813 is about 1500 to 2 kV and the original connector on there was a Belling Lee TV socket so it's definitely not very safe so that's the reason why that had to go and we put a SMV high voltage uh, connector on there. A uh, couple of other things. I've changed the coax here. This was this coax that was on there originally was um, looking a bit shabby, so I've changed that over. And another interesting health and safety feature that uh, from the 1950s. So this we have to be very careful of because that's asbestos. So steer well clear of that and don't uh, don't don't really want to touch that. So let's have a look on the underside 
and see what we've got on there underneath. So I've got the thing turned over and we'll start looking at the PA again, what it looks like underneath. And when I first opened this, <laughs> uh, there was some really dodgy wiring uh, in the sense that, um, well, the original wiring was, was pretty uh, scary. Um, so I've actually replaced some of these high voltage lines. I mean, this is actually, this huge re resistor here is the screen dropping resistor. It's absolutely massive. And uh, they, they had sort of very um, flimsy looking wiring on there originally. Uh, so I've actually replaced a lot of that with, um, you know, proper high voltage um, uh, cable, wire, call it what you like. So you can see there's the base of the 813 and there's a, I'm not sure if that's a neutralizing capacitor or what, um, or of tuning the grid, possibly. I haven't really had a chance to go through the whole thing in great detail yet. So that's the, uh, obviously the underside of the uh, tank coil. And over here we've got the 5763s, which are the, for the exciter. So it's quite interesting that for the VFO and the Exciter, they all use the same type of valves, 5763s, which are sort of standard uh, HF, VHF uh, tetrodes. And another thing which I thought was a bit peculiar was that those components there, actually, what you see there, I can get it in the light a bit better, are for the VFO. Because normally normally you put all the components in a, in a box, but I think the, the box just... Um, has the uh, sort of tuning coils and the uh, capacitor there for the uh, for the VFO, because theoretically all these components could be exposed to heat and cause the thing to drift. But apparently, from what I've researched, the VFO on these are supposed to be reasonably okay in terms of drift. Uh, so that box there is really where all the uh, power uh, comes in. It's originally used a Jones connector so I'm gonna to have to sort of figure out what what's what on this thing uh, I've got a circuit diagram um, there's a couple of queries that I've got to sort out in terms of you know how the thing is keyed uh, various connections for voltages and things like that anyhow the next question is how are we going to build an HD power supply for this and what are we going to do for the modulator Right, so we've got a nice selection of heavy iron here which we're going to use for the power supply and the modulator for this LG300. So the black transformer there is going to be my HT transformer, that's a Palmeco, it's 450, 0450, 160 milliamps, probably a little bit low for an 813 in terms of the current uh, requirements but I think these Palmeco transformers are usually a, tend to be a bit underrated so I think it might uh, it might be okay I hope it will um, I've got this other transformer here which is 290 uh, center tap 290 uh, I think that's like an amplifier transformer because I think we've got to provide about 250 volts or thereabouts for the exciter. The VFO also requires 150 volts stabilized, so I'm going to have to come up with a plan to provide that. The the modulator, I'm, I'm doing this slightly different. The, the sort of normal way you would do this is use a big modulation transformer, you know, build up a modulator, which is very similar to an audio amplifier and then uh, run that into a big mod transformer like a, a Woden UM3 or something like that. Um, but UM3s are not easy to find and um, they do have their own problems, they're quite weighty. So we're going to do this a bit different for this uh, but for the modulator of this LG300. We're going to use one of these which is actually a mod transformer from a burn debt transmitter. Burn debt, I can't remember the exact name, but the, but the, 
it's quite a well-known VHF transmitter which used to have a 4CX250 in the PA which was modulated by one of these transformers and these are quite clever little things or not so little I suppose uh, so these are these have got a low impedance primary winding so you can actually run it you can run the audio from a solid state amplifier such as this MOSFET amplifier I think it's rated about 200 watts or thereabouts so you can run the output of your solid state amplifier which is typically low impedance you know say four six ohms thereabouts and you can run it into this transformer and this uh, has a output which goes to the anode of your PA valve and also you've got an output there uh, tapping for the, uh, the screen I'll just zoom in on that so you can see it a bit better so you've got tappings for the the anode and the screen uh, grid and I think uh, several people have used this, used one of these. I know my mate Ian G6TVJ has built up a modulator with one of these burn debt transformers and people have built up transmitters for 80 meters on 3615 using using uh, this this modulation transformer. So I think it'll be a work, I think it's going to be a good plan to use this because it'll be a lot more compact but we do have to we do actually need another uh, transformer to supply this so I'm gonna I have actually got a toroidal transformer which will do about 40 volts or 40 to 50 volts uh, at about uh, what is it about five amps five six amps something like that uh, for that uh, MOSFET amplifier anyhow uh, I think we've got uh, quite a bit of work to do to get all this put all this together in order to uh, fire up the uh, the LG 300 but I think that uh, once we do that we should have quite a nice ham radio AM transmitter real nice vintage 1950s AM transmitter or as the ad said a real man's transmitter Anyhow, we'll be back in part two, and we'll see how we get along. It might be a few, might be a, a few weeks, what with the work and all that, but uh, we should be we should uh, should be able to do it. See, cheers for now, and catch you again soon.